Shalom, shalom, shalom. My name is Michael Sano, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the 12 Cities in Israel podcast. Today, I am sitting with Mark Rosenberg, the Vice President of Diaspora Relationships from Nefesh Benefesh. Welcome to the program, Mark. Thank you. How Good are you? Michael, it's so great to be here, so close to the beach and talking to you. Thank you. It is. It, this is the best location. We're at the, the C Executive Suites. So I can plug that. Um, and I everyone who comes is, wow, this is really great. Must have cost, a, it didn't cost a fortune. So please. And anytime I'm here, you feel free to come and stay. That couch over there, it's a bed. So be careful. It's so close to the beach. It's worth coming. It's, <laughs> it's the best of both worlds. So close and so nice. Well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this twice a year. Um, right now, it's February. So it's cold even in Tel Aviv. And people have been saying it's the coldest it's ever been. Um, but six months from now, it's not going to be that cold. So you're definitely going to have to it come. It turns into Hell Aviv, people call it. It's so hot. <laughs> but the truth is, it's such a great time to come. It's cold. I, I live in Jerusalem, so mm-hmm. it's much colder there. So it's nice to come here. I think it's warm. It's like the people from New York go down to Florida, and they're in shorts, and the, and the residents of Florida have their winter coats on. <laughs> so I, I have that type of uh, winter uh, lag. Well, there. you are from somewhere else. Where are you from? So I grew up in um, a suburb of Philadelphia, actually Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Get uh, out of here. Exit four on the New Jersey Turnpike. Holy cow. Yep. You have a connection? Uh, All right. So my wife is from Havertown, which is right outside of Philadelphia, but she was born and raised in Philly. And as the, what is it, as, as... as the neighborhoods got a little rougher, her family moved farther out. So. Sure, sure. So uh, New Jersey is a, a a wonderful state. I'm I'm a very proud New Jersey uh, a New Jersey boy. Um, it's divided into two. Half of it is like a suburb of New York, like uh, Trenton and mm-hmm. North. And the, I was in the southern part, which is a suburb of Philadelphia. Like I know nothing growing up about New York. I knew the Yankees were there, but I didn't know any of the neighborhoods. That's hilarious. Um, I heard about this Lower East Side where my ancestors arrived and moved there, but I didn't know my way around this, uh, the Bronx, the Five Towns. All these places didn't, meant nothing to me. Um, but it really was a suburb of Philadelphia. The athletes of the mm-hmm. Philadelphia lived in Cherry Hill and used to see them around. Um, I, I grew up, I usually say, I grew up in a very traditional family. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to public school growing up, um, but Cherry Hill was the type of town that it was closed on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur because there were mm-hmm. a lot of teachers in the school and the town is about 10%, maybe 12% of Jews of all affiliations lived there. So there was a... a well, few, that's a big population. It's a big population. There were a big JCC, a few big reform and conservative shuls that, that were there. Um, and I went to Jewish summer camp. And so it was a, a nice balance of both going to public school and getting, oh, I thought it was a great education um, and, and having this outlet that was a really, very big connection for me, which was going to uh, Camp Ramah, a Jewish summer camp. And I, I, it, was, it was a great place to grow up. It was, uh, it, was, it was a great feeling. I have two older brothers and a younger sister. Uh, very much uh, a great feeling. And also, my parents were people who were very connected in the Jewish community, across the Jewish community. I say this about my father. Um, he, we, he was a member of two different shuls. Wow. Uh, an Orthodox and conservative shul. Holy cow. Which was wonderful because when he slept in, everyone thought he was at the other shul. <laughs> he pur- purposely had a time that people like, everyone thought he was like, oh, he must be there. And he was at home sleeping or not, not sleeping in. <laughs> so, and my mother was very involved in Hadassah. And I grew, grew up with all these meetings in our house. We had to clean up and help out and set up the food because there was a fundraiser wow. for Hadassah Hospital um, or the causes that Hadassah was doing in Israel. So this idea that Israel was a part of her life and giving to the Jewish community and being connected was what was was a big part of the values, which is a little bit of ironic because my first job in Israel was I was I was employee of Hadassah, working for their youth program here in Israel. And my mom was like, I can't believe you moved to Israel and Hadassah is paying your paycheck. My <laughs> all, all this time, you know, the reason you're so far away from me is is that. And so there there was an interesting closing of the circles that, that my first No, job. that's wonderful. So what was it that prompted you? You've given some insight into into your roots in the Jewish mm-hmm. community and your roots into your Jewish identity. But what was it that prompted you to move to Israel? Because that is a step. That is a commitment. What was it? It's a great question. Um, everyone has their own sort of moment that it happened to me. But I think a critical moment that happens to, I think, a lot of uh, Americans or Westerners when, they, when the, the, they think about what was that point that they grew up. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it was that first Friday night when I was in college. So I grew up in a family. We always had Friday night dinner. You could do whatever you want afterwards. You could go out to your friends, go out to the movies. But there was a, a strong emphasis that we were going to have a Shabbat dinner together. Um, and it, 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 it impacted me, I guess. But when I was 18, 
Um, I went to George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Congratulations. Um, it was That's good. a good school. Yeah, it was a, it was a good school. I loved it. Was, listen, it was far enough away, close enough away. It was two and a half <laughs> yeah. hour drives. It was nice. My older brother went there. I liked the idea of living in the city. I was five blocks from the White House. I thought I wanted to go in political science because my brother, but two older brothers both studied political science as oh, well. Wow. And that very first Friday night came, my parents dropped me off and I was like, oh, what am I going to do? Yeah. Wow. Like, here I am. I could go out. I could go to the Hillow House. Um, I could do whatever I want and my parents wouldn't really know and they don't have to know or I could lie to them and tell them I went but it was the first time I had to ask a question of myself what do I want to do for myself not because someone was making me mm -hmm. so it caused me to pause and I was very uh, open to peer pressure like, what, what are people going to think and it was the first time I say like, wait should I really care about what other people think about me like is shouldn't I do what I want to do on a Friday night is it really important if it's cool or not cool I had already prejudged the Hillow House at, at, at G George Washington University, which should say the undergraduate is a third Jewish. <laughs> okay, there's wow. like six, 7,000 undergraduate, and a third of them are, are Jewish. Wow. Okay, it was very common to see people putting up a mezuzah on a door, okay, regardless of it. But yet I was feeling this shyness about, you know, am I okay to say this? Is this what I want to feel? And it led me to read. It led me to say, okay, I got to read about this. I, I just, I mean, today we just say, just Google it. But this was a, <laughs> it was a year that started with the a number one. Okay. So it was a pre-Google era. And I started reading a lot. I started reading books and asking questions. And there was only really one synagogue in walking distance to George Washington's campus. And I wandered there on a Shabbat morning. And uh, I was captured by the way that people spoke. It was a very small shul and people were warm and welcomed just curious questions. And I stood, went through this process of saying, you know, what, what's important to me? Why is Shabbat even important? Why is, uh, what's, what, are, what, are we, what are we really pursuing? And it led to me to a lot of talking and reading and reading more and more. And I think something happened to me during finals that first semester. I read, which was a, a transformative book for me by, I think it's Milton Sternberg called As a Driven Leaf. Um, and it was historical fiction about this heretic who goes through this life-changing experience. I'm reading it during finals. Like I, I was like <laughs> willing to juggle all my pressures of college. And, but I was captivated by this, this rabbi's search for his authenticity. Um, and, uh, and I made a decision then I was going to make steps forward to reconnect to my roots. Um, and that brings me back to my family roots. So I have two, two older brothers I, I, I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Both of them studied political science and both of them studied abroad in Israel at their junior year of college. Oh, wow. And I wanted to be different. So I was like, I realized I wanted to be an English major. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was going to go to England my junior year abroad. I was going to, I, I was, I was, I was going to go follow after the bard and, and be a disciple of Shakespeare. But as time passed in, in college and I read more and more, I was drawn to this idea of Israel. Um, and to and to see what it was like to live like a Jew out loud. Because at this time at GW, I was like secretly going underneath this change and deciding myself, but I was uncomfortable revealing it to people. Like I would go out Friday nights with my friends in a way that I was comfortable with. You know, there's mm -hmm. ways you can go out, you not necessarily buy drinks, but hang out. So I wasn't using money or things like that. And I was navigating this way of what it meant to be Jewish in America. And under these terms that I was, it was very weird for me. So I found myself saying, I, I was going to admit that I was going to follow after my brothers. And I, I went junior abroad to Hebrew University. I used to say it was the best year of my life. My wife is very <laughs> insulted when I say that. So now I say it is one of the best years of my life. And... Something happened. I, I was able to live out loud what I what I felt, and I was comfortable to explore ideas. I, I I learned as much as I could. I would go away for Shabbats in different places wherever I could have an experience, um, and try to seek out different opportunities. Uh, one of the most the largest yeshivas in Israel is the Mir in Meir Sharim. Mm -hmm. It's like a you know, so I found someone I could study with there one hour a week and stuff like that. I was the guy in the flannel the uh, uh, the the flannel shirt and, and that was only wearing wearing a colored <laughs> shirt. In there. I I would go different places, north, south, east, and west in Israel, just to be able to experience what this was about. And when I returned after my junior year abroad, I realized that I realized two things about myself. One is I have a passion for teaching. And I wanted to become a teacher. Wow. I realized my calling in life was that I am good at connecting with people and that's what I wanted to do, which I was lost about beforehand. Um, and the second was that there's something in Israel that I feel a little bit more connected and alive. And when I went back to finish my college degree, I didn't fit back into America. Uh, I had great friends and I stayed in D.C. And I became active in my, both my school where I was working and I became the chair of the English department. And I became active in my synagogue and, and the JCC. I taught in Hebrew school, did lots of great things. But I saw myself on a different social stratosphere of seeing events happening, not really connecting them as much. Um, 
and the conversations, a lot of the people in my community were lawyers and uh, professionals and working for the government offices. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt on a different cultural pace, not only because I was an idealist educator, I was mm -hmm. one of the few educators that was there, but I felt myself um, fitting better back into the, the fabric that is Israeli society. That's, so, uh, that's, that's really interesting because, um, and in no way to take away from your story by giving mine, but it helps me um, pull your story out a little more. I went to Ben Gurion University for two, uh, two summers for Ulpan, and you said something. It's like you didn't fit back into society when you went back, and that was one of the sad things that my wife noticed when I get when I went back home, and she came with me last year uh, to go to a wedding of a friend of mine's son, and she said, "Wow, I totally see it. I totally see it." So I think there's oh, it's it's a beautiful to um, not compartmentalize that feeling, Michael. Uh, too often we do. It's like, oh, I only can feel that in Israel. I think one of the beautiful things I think about Judaism is that there's the idea of the, my my conception of this idea of mm -hmm. holiness in Judaism is that we have a sacredness, and the whole idea of Shabbat is it's sacredness in time, and you can do it anywhere. You can do it in L.A. You can do it in New York, in Philly, in Australia. You can do it anywhere. And Israel, in a Jewish conception, is holy land. It's holy space. It's a very exception. So it's nice that when you come here, you feel that feeling, but it's, it's the music, it's the food, it's, it's all those things. And so it's nice to have that. And people come back to drink it and mm -hmm. feel it, and, and they, or they'll try and replicate it wherever they are so they, ha so they have that type of feeling. So it's, it's, it's having that element, and, take, and you can take it with you, and people put up art. That's why we have art on our wall. It reminds us of feelings or places we want to be. And we sing certain songs because it brings us back to that place and smells. So I, I, it wasn't enough that I was having hummus, you know, a couple of times a week or making shakshuka or listening to, uh, you know, this music that is much better now than it was 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> but, Tutu bon. uh, yes. So I, 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 I wanted to connect back into that. And I, I, I began uh, dating and I, I, it became clear to me that uh, this was not going to, uh, that, that I wanted to meet someone who was going to live in Israel and, it's a better idea to, to do that. But it, the, the confidence, the, the aha moment I had mm -hmm. was, was just going back and saying, I just see that there's more, uh, the, the dynamic part of life that is the Mediterranean lifestyle in Israel um, would be a better place for me to experience the normal struggles of life. Definitely. Now, did you, after graduating from college, did you go on to become a teacher or did you immediately come over here so I, I i like to say i had to stay to pay off my debts to society um <laughs> i actually began a graduate program 10 days after my undergraduate graduation holy wow so gw offered a highly subsidized master's in education for a year like a year summer year summer mm -hmm. um and i realized okay i want to be a teacher i'll do it i'll teach english and english as a second language with my eye to teaching in israel Mm -hmm. I'll get the certificate and I'll pay down my debts to society and I'll come. So I did that. It was a, it was a great experience. And I taught for two years in the DC public school system. Wow. Um, seventh grade, uh, whole podcast in on just, on just, oh my on just that experience. I got some great stories there. Uh, but upon my graduation from graduate school, I remember where I was by the subway in Foggy Bottom next to George Washington's bust where we took a picture and I said to my mom, and she's going to listen to this and she's going to remember <laughs> this, where I said to her, uh, mom, I'm graduating, but I, I, I know that I think my future is going to be in Israel for years. And she said something brilliant. She said, my mom, the social worker, she said, my, uh, my outside voice is saying, that's wonderful, you should follow your dreams. And my inside voice is saying, oh my goodness, my baby boy's moving far away. Oh. Uh, but I, I had my eye on the prize at that point. And I, uh, so I worked for two years and I paid down my debts and saved up and started networking for a job. And I was able to land a job. So when I came in the summer of 2001, I had a job working for a young Judea, Hadassah's youth movement in Israel. Which, of course, leads back to what you had said with your mom. You're working there. Get, they're giving you the check. Now, from there, how long did you work there? And then what was the transition from there into Nefesh Penefesh? Sure. So um, that job I took with Young Today, I was highly overqualified and underpaid <laughs> for it. I, essentially, I was a dorm counselor. They needed, they needed someone who was going to be able in charge of these 18-year-old gap students who were experiencing a year away from their families oh, um, wow. studying in Israel. And for me as an educator, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to have housing. Okay, I'm going to mm -hmm. be an educational institution. I work on my Hebrew. I want to find a job. So I did that, and then the, the halfway, halfway through the year, like, wait a minute, you know how to teach. Do, we, do you mind teaching a class? So I said, sure. And then the following year, I said, do you want to come back on the administration? I said, okay, I'll look for a job, and they paid me a little bit more. 
But during that year, they said, do you want to move the faculty full time? So I loved it. I worked, I worked with 18 year olds, such a age of growth and people experiencing Israel like I did when I was 20, 21, but mm-hmm. here they're experiencing Israel. And I had a great, in total, about seven years I worked with uh, young Judea. Um, and it was, it was amazing. It was, it was, I never taught English. I, I, it was not teaching my, 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 my studies, my professional studies as a master's in uh, teaching English as a second language, but I was able to teach Jewish history and different classes and different subject. And it was a, a, a incredible experience, um, that I, uh, I feel, I feel blessed that I was able to work with tremendous students from that are now around the world and they, I, I'm able to keep in touch with them. And then I, I came to an Israeli moment, uh, a crossroads that happened mm-hmm. in my life. So it's, uh, I don't want to play up the drama point, but, uh, but I guess it's good for a podcast <laughs> to it. So um, we came to, I, I had a, a contract dispute with uh, my employer. Oh, wow. Um, it sometimes happens. They it wanted does. to say that maybe teachers should not be paid in the summer or have to work in the summer. You know, the three best reasons to teach, June, July, and <laughs> exactly. August. Exactly. So uh, they changed the contract uh, strategically. They wanted to do something. And me and a few other colleagues said, you know what? No, we don't want to do that. And we didn't sign it. And we came to an agreement that we'd finish the year teaching. Mm-hmm. Okay, so June, our contract, I'd have to find another job. So that was about in February, January, February. That must have been scary, too, because you pretty much recently made Aliyah. That was was seven years, but I actually coasted. The the job fell on me, and it kept on getting promoted and fell into a great dream job. So this was the first, like, obstacle that I had had really hit. Um, And to complicate things... um, we found out a couple months before that my wife was pregnant with twins. Oh my gosh! Okay, Muzzle tone. It was but we were. I, I still remember that feeling. The, the, feel, the, the feeling so. of holding my hands, <laughs> my, my wife's hand, in the doctor's office as as she said it, and like we're squeezing her hands like two heartbeats. What's going on? <laughs> and on top of it, we had recently decided to purchase real estate in Israel, which was the first grown up moment I really had. And I, oh wow! And and it wasn't ready in time because you know, we bought on paper, so we were paying a mortgage and a balloon loan. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose my job, and what's going to happen for it? And to make matters worse, my dad died suddenly. Oh, I'm so so sorry. I have what my therapist told me: a lot of trauma is happening at the same time. Moving, childbirth, losing a job, and then losing a parent. It's almost unbearable. Almost having in February. So it was a it was a t- tumultuous time, and I it was able to guide through a lot, lot through with a partnership of my wife and uh, and a mentor or two that came along, and I uh, I said you know what I'm going to go back to teaching English as a second language, so I started interviewing around, <laughs> and people offered me jobs. It was amazing, but no one would tell me how much money I would make. Really? Oh, you know, it's Israel, so it's like oh it depends. Uh, you have to see how much, and there, I discovered for the first time the really the bureaucracy in Israel. Mm-hmm. So I went down to uh, the Ministry of Education and the Teachers Union, and no one could tell me because I taught for so many years my teaching license. So now I can tell you, Michael, what you do is you call up Nefesh Benefesh, okay? <laughs> and Nefesh Benefesh connects you with the person, and they tell you what you need. We have an article on our website that says this, you have to bring this, this to this date, and they get it recognized. But I didn't make Aliyah with Nefesh Benefesh. <laughs> I made Aliyah by myself. The, st- the organization started the year I came about. So I had no one to turn to. So I was like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? So I decided, you know what? Maybe I should leave teaching. Maybe I need to do something else. Maybe I need to earn a little bit more than what teachers make. Because mm-hmm. what I heard the salary was going to be was, you know, as teachers don't make a lot of money in America, they don't make a lot of money in Israel. So I started wondering, okay, what am I going to do? What am I, what am I going to do? So I uh, eventually uh, found myself at a neighbor of a friend of mine. Um, she actually is a, one of my uh, close colleagues at Nefesh Ben Nefesh, and she's an employment counselor. And she said to me, Mark, what are your skills? And I said to her, well, you know, Rachel, uh, I'm an educator. And she said, no, she started screaming, that's a profession. What are your skills? After 20 minutes of working me over worse than like a karate <laughs> masseuse, she was able to say, to, I can tell you that my skills are I'm a good writer. I'm a very good editor. I'm comfortable standing before large groups of people. I can connect with people one-on-one. Um, I'm very creative. And I can translate complex ideas so people can understand them. And then she responded and said, oh, that's PR and marketing, what both my older brothers do. <laughs> I'm like, oh. <laughs> But what she did, she was able to recast myself, and and I so I went on all these interviews as mm-hmm. someone who's looking for a PR marketing job instead of a teacher pretending to try and get a job at a sales company. I had this confidence a little bit more, and uh, there was a uh, I heard about it from another friend uh, that there was a position opening at uh, Nefesh Ben Nefesh. I felt as if I was a little overqualified for it, uh, similar to being a dorm counselor, but for, for Olim in a city, I went in the interview for it, and the person there said, no, 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 we think we have another job for you. And uh, there was an opening on the marketing team, mm-hmm. and 
and things worked out. It was a good interview process. I very much knew very little about what Nefesh but Nefesh did when I when, when it was almost eleven years ago, uh, when I went in for that interview. I I, I read about their website, asked a few friends, um, but I I saw this opportunity to use my communication skills, um, and it's been an adventure since. Now, can you describe what Nefesh but Nefesh is? What they do? What's their mission? Sure. So I, I, the teacher of me is going to go back a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so um, the Jews have always thought about moving to the land of Israel, maybe since Abraham a long time ago, got that calling. Um, but uh, after the destruction of the second temple in the year 70 of the common era, you know, it was difficult. And the, mm-hmm. the rulers here did not like it so much. Um, Professor Shlomo Avineri says there's a great paradox that when Jews wanted to move to Israel, they couldn't. Okay. And when they could, they didn't. <laughs> So what happened in, is in the 1880s is that groups of Jews started moving here. Okay, It was very, very difficult for them. Not just ind- individuals were always coming through and traveling, but groups started coming in the 1880s and had a lot of difficulty. Um, and then in 1904, a new wave started coming, and they realized, we've got to get organized, because if I'm going to have an orange orchard and you're going to have an orange orchard, we're going to have too many oranges in the marketplace, so let's get organized. And they founded this Jewish agency, which was going to say, okay, you organize this, and then they said, wait a minute, I need health care, so I'm going to start a health care plan for myself, and we're communists, so we're going to call it this, and we're going to have a bank, we're going to call it uh, Pauline, and they all started the foundation of this country. Uh, and indeed, the head of the Jewish agency in 1947 was David Ben-Gurion. Okay, so Amazing. when so when the state gets formed, it's very natural that the head of the Jewish agency is going to move over to be the temporary, you know, steward of the state and elected. He was act surprise shocker elected to be the first prime minister of Israel, um, and therefore the Jewish agency, which took on this responsibility of organizing Aliyah through the twenties, thirties, forties, continued in this role as um, as the as a responsibility for Aliyah, um, and this continued on, um, and then. Um, in 2001 is when Nefesh Benefesh comes on the story, um, and it's a story. Uh, I, I I always apologize because I don't, don't tell, I don't okay. tell the story as great as the founder does. Um, uh, Josh Fass, uh, it was a nice American kid who you know dreamed about Israel and had that connection to it, um, and he actually dreamed of being a doctor and uh, was on a path to maybe go into medical school and he was doing research and it turns out the researcher lost some money on a on, on a project so he's like in the meantime maybe I should go to rabbinical school you know I was he was right there and he he got bit by that bug and mm-hmm. he, he became a rabbi and he met his wife and his wife they talked about Aliyah and moving to Israel and that was part of their plan. And then he got this job and had kids and life got in the way. Um, and sadly, in 2001, he had a, had a cousin who was at a bus stop near Netanya. Mm. Um, when a Hamas suicide bomber came up to the place, and it always strikes me because the place was, uh, was uh, the Shalom uh, Junction, the Shalom uh, place, a place of peace. And he detonated that bomb and killed a 13-year-old boy and his best friend and injured many of other people. And Rabbi Fast now in, in Boca Raton, Florida, got up shul the following Shabbat. And in front of his congregation said, this tragedy happened to my family. And in reaction to it, I and my family are going to move to Israel. Wow. Okay. That we feel this emotional connection. We've talked about it. And the only thing that we can do is make that leap forward. So afterwards, you know, Jews talk and eat. And they came up to him and was like, uh, everyone, it's amazing what you said. We th- we think, we're thinking about making Aliyah. We always thought about it. When I was younger, I, was, I, I want to make Aliyah. And everyone finished that sentence with, but. But what about my job and my kids? Where am I going to live? And he's like, wait a minute, there's a high desire of people to do it. Mm-hmm. Something strange here. And he started. He spoke to a, a philanthropist in the shul who runs a business, and mm-hmm. he said, wait a minute, is there something here? Like, what's going on? Why? What's, what's not happening? And the truth is what happened is, is that most of the people who wanted to make Aliyah, they either did it themselves, and to do that process, they would go to the Jewish agency who would interview them, make sure you have your documents in, and to do it. But the way that they did it, and the way that was very Israeli, and, and we're sitting, we're, again, we're sitting in Tel Aviv here. Tel Aviv has matured a lot, and therefore the the guy that, who let me in here was was his English was great, and he he was nice. But uh, Israelis were known to come to America and say, "You two come to Israel. It's terrible here. You, it's horrible." I said, Picture someone in La Jolla. <laughs> it's terrible here. Israel's much better. You two come. You two come. It's the is, the Israeli approach was to negate the diaspora, to push it down. And to and to just be very brusque. They didn't really understand the dynamics of the community, the people, what they're going through. So there was a, a high interest, but yet about a thousand Jews from North America were moving into, into Israel in 1999. 1,200, 1,100, it was low numbers. Yeah. And so he said, wait a minute, why don't we start this organization that's going to help North American Jews 
um, overcome the obstacles of, and the, he, he did some research, was basically employment, the bureaucracy, okay, finding a community, and some financial concerns that they have. And if North Americans can advise other North Americans how to do it, we have those sensitivities. But the most powerful idea that he had was that the state of Israel's approach to Olim was very much um, uh, of aliyah of need, um, aliyah of anti-Semitism, aliyah that people were running away from something. Like, we're here for you. Come on. Okay, you can come to Israel. <laughs> okay, there's unfortunately a rise. You can always come to us. But Westerners around the world, and, and you, the United States and Canada are, are, are maybe typify this the most, they have choices, and they're living wonderful, powerful, and meaningful Jewish lives, and they have choices. And one of the choices they're thinking about is moving to Israel. So rather than guilt them or shame them into this, relate to them as the power of choice. And, and he believed, and I think the proof is in the pudding that 60,000 60, plus North Americans have come mm -hmm. in the past 18 years, uh, they, they can choose to come, and they'll respond in those choices by by proper expectations. So he, he he came to Israel and he met with Natan Sharansky and met with people in the government and everyone thought in, uh, bombs were blowing up in Israel and said, okay, you're going to bring North Americans? Okay, this it's a good idea. We'll help you. It's nice. This is this is great. And they filled about 400 people on a plane and that is July 2000, uh, 2002. And he had landed and he's like, okay, I guess we really got to help these people find jobs and help them with <laughs> schools and help them with their licensing as teachers or doctors. And, and that's where the, the hard work really began the organization because my wife, uh, my wife moved to Israel in 1987. Okay. Uh, her family chose to move her. She was nine years old. And she says the hardest part when she got here was the only thing she recognized in the supermarket was Coca-Cola. Okay. Wow. Now we have we have cinnamon toast crunch, <laughs> Skippy peanut butter. We've got a, there's American products everywhere. That, but she remembers there was like ugh, the yogurts were terrible. There was there's nothing that she recognized. And the truth is, the, the statistics show that sixty percent of North Americans left within the two years. Really, a very high. And Israel in the eighties, high inflation. Okay, oh, it, okay. Wasn't, yeah. it wasn't it was it wasn't and and no one was really helping them. It was. I mean, my my wife actually. Uh, there were there were about thirty five, forty families in the Merkaz Klita that that she moved to, and almost all of them are stayed and successful. They 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 they're, they're still here. Big families, amazing, amazing. But the story for so many people was that they came and they left, and they felt as if they were brought here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there wasn't uh, Aliyah was about getting to the airport and it dropped. So Nefesh Benefesh uh, set out to really make sure that they would uh, be integrated and stay. And we're proud to say that a um, little about almost 90% of our Olim are still here three years later. Um, and, and, and the effort goes into make sure that they have proper expectations when they come. So again, if I have a problem with my teaching license, I know who to call, <laughs> I know who to call up and, and they'll, they'll, they'll help you do it. Um, there's amazing, phenomenal things happening for doctors. And if you were a board certified doctor 10 years ago to Israel, they'd like, okay, you have to start again uh, to get really? a license. Because Maza board certified, they like, they don't understand they, the system here antiquated and Okay. Not, I mean, we still love the fax machine. They had to pass a law to end faxing government. Really? Law. Oh, they love the fax machine here. <laughs> so a part of that, the part of that modernization of Israel had took took time to get to. And we're proud to be partners with all the government organizations to help to help lead that change, and especially with the Jewish Agency to work with them to make sure that this process can be easier. And we see this having ripple effects in other countries as well. This attitude and showing them that if you remove the move the remove the obstacles, um, then the people who want to come they'll have an easier time. Now, what are some of the the, what are some of the transition services that Nefesh, Nefesh Benefesh has in place? Um, like for the simple things, like getting a driver's license, getting a lease, you know, finding a home, knowing, because for, for a lot of people, these simple things that we would just Google, it'll come up in Hebrew. Sure. Um, and we will go, we won't be able to do this. What do I do now? What do I do now? So it's easier than ever because of Google Translate and more fixing these things that help them. I mean, uh, I've, I'm here a long time and my Hebrew is good and I WhatsApp in Hebrew and do things. But I do use often Google Translate, at least to, you know, strengthen. I'll, I'll edit it before I send it because <laughs> Lord knows uh, there's enough typos in English that I don't need to add to the typos in Hebrew with mistakes. Why does um, he think I have goats? I don't yes. have goats. So... Um, uh, a lot of it is uh, a combination of lobbying, of, of, of working with the, the government to understand that um, someone who's been driving for 25 years or five years, mm -hmm. okay, should be able to just convert their driver's license, proving they show the, the, the proof of driving for five years and that we were successful, able to do that. Um, the second is just uh, sharing that information. So we have this online library we call an Aliyapedia of articles that we work very hard to maintain updated so people manage their expectations of what they need to bring and where to go. 
um, and it's available in English. So people say, okay, I want to convert my driver's license, and you go to our website, and we'll tell you this, this, and this. You can call us up, and we'll help you, and we'll explain it um, if you have trouble, but it's able to really break down so someone has that information. We specialize in your first two weeks in Israel. So we'll call you and explain to you, and we'll send you a video so you know where you need to go. To, that's where you set up your health care. Mm-hmm. And so you understand your health care benefits, and you, and you have to be able to set up these payments that you have, or sign up for intensive Hebrew studies. We want to make sure that people have the access to all of the normal things uh, that happen. You're right. If you move from Texas to California, you have to worry about some license and changing yeah. things. And trust me, the DMV in every country is bad. <laughs> and Israel's oh, it's so bad. It's the DMV is the DMV regardless of the country. Um, so we really are, are, are the advocacy that we do for people to make sure that they understand those obstacles and registering for uh, school for your children. Oh um, yeah, I didn't even think of something like it's that. It's also it's also Michael to say it's not just for the stage of life you're in now for the, for for the next stage. If you're you come with a seven year old and they get to be seventeen and they might have an army obligation, then we have army advisors that are able to speak to the parents about what does it mean the process of drafting and the options and the units if you thought choosing a college was difficult understanding the options of army service for people is much more complicated well that was my next question actually and i i'm not trying to interrupt but i i've i've been to the fairs and we'll talk about the fairs in a moment the alia fairs and one of the panels that you have is about idf just going into the idf and not just for the parents but i know from when i was in college there are kids that i was in hillel with who were like i'm gonna make aliyah going into the army and that was their big dream so what do, what, what do you offer for them so currently there are actually um, 950 north americans serving in the idf okay it's, it's, it's amazing um there are about 300 350 that come in each year and go out so it's like uh it's quite an interesting wave. They are serving in all different units from submarines to just being on the radio for Dover Tzahal, Israel's spokesperson offense, uh, office. They're, they're doing amazing things. Um, so I was 25 when I came, and the, and I actually got called to the Army service. I, I got called to draft it, and mm-hmm. I think I failed the Hebrew test. Um, I couldn't tell how many windows they were because the whole feminine, masculine of Hebrew, it's like so difficult. Or theme. Um, and um, and they said, don't call us, we won't call you. And I was crushed, I was crushed. Because Aww. that Zionist dream, the camp I went to, all these stories I had of all these people. And I thought for a second, and then someone gave me good advice and said, listen, there's many ways to serve the country, okay? And paying taxes is one great one of them. <laughs> and if the army doesn't want you, you have to, uh, you have to do it. Um, and actually, it was... It was, it was uh, an epiphany of sorts because many people have that dream of serving in the army. And our job is to make sure people understand what that service is really like. It's hard being bossed around by a 19 year old in Hebrew, oh, especially yeah. if you're 21 and you finish college, you're 22. It's, you have to really know what you're getting involved in, especially being far away from your family. So our advisors and our team really work with people to understand what the technical process is and what the, what the timetable, the army will only draft you nine months after you move to give you time to regulate the Israeli society, but you can move it up if you want to. What unit are you going to go into? Is your Hebrew good enough? We want people to have honest, you know, the, great, the book, Great Expectations. Yeah. We want them honest expectations so that they understand what's, what's being involved. And I'll just tell you a quick story. So I had a student from Young mm-hmm. Judea, um, Gabi, who was one of those problematic students. And <laughs> he was on double secret probation because he just, the rules were suggested which is funny because I would say that in Israel, <laughs> rules are suggestions. But we saw that there was good in him. And at the end of the year, I said goodbye to Gabi. And I thought it was forever because I he was you know, a little bit troublesome. And three years later, I got an email back from him saying, I'm coming to Israel to do the army. Can I stay with you for a few days? Whoa. So I asked my wife, who I'm married now, and she said, sure, he doesn't have family here. Tell me he can stay with us as long <laughs> as he needs. <laughs> Four months later, he moved out. Um, I eventually walked him down the aisle at his wedding, and we're we're really very close. Yeah, but what's interesting so when you ask Gabi about his army service, he'll say the first four months were amazing, basic training. He was in tanks. The next year was really difficult. And the final four months were amazing, and to this day he'll say it was amazing. I'm like Gabi, that year was difficult. It was cold in that tank on the Lebanese border. No, no, no. It's hard for people when they just see the pictures and the glory. And same thing about life in Israel. When you come to visit, you see the greatness and you're eating out all the time. And <laughs> you, you don't have to worry about the teacher who's like not doing their own, not, not grading the papers or being fair. You see the goodness that there. And therefore, we, sh- and nefesh nefesh, we strike this balance between being honest and inspirational. How do you bring someone's down so that they're not going to be like, you never told me that you don't get it every week in the army. We told you, we died, but, <laughs> but but they'll have that feeling. So especially with the soldiers and the families as well, and even the retirees, we want to make sure that they have a, a great 
accounting of what it means. Um, for example, for, for men, it's the age 22. So you can serve if you're older 22 and you have to serve. So maybe if you're 21, you're not sure, come after you're 22. You can, you can plan these items. If you, you want to serve, uh, we, a lot of people want to serve in the spokesperson's office. The most popular unit actually in the <laughs> Army is, do you know what you remember this? Is actually the computers unit. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So everybody wants to be in the cyber unit because it launches them to a, an incredible career in high tech in Israel and cybersecurity <laughs> and people go on to be millionaires, the legend of the startup nation. So people have this, uh, oh, how do I get into it? And therefore they can, it's, it's like a corporation. The army is like a corporation. So it's not the idealism. Oh, I'm going to have enough. You know, I'll be in the army. I'll be wearing green, green in the beret. It's actually practical. What are you going to do there? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just about information, supporting the people about what their needs, what your Hebrew level is. Because if you're not speaking Hebrew and they draft you, you're going to spend several months in, I call it Dr. Seuss's waiting place, Ulpan, where you, like everyone else is doing fun stuff and you're sitting in a classroom practicing your Hebrew because they don't want to put you in a unit when you don't understand the Absolutely. words. Absolutely. And that's crushing for people to think they're going to get off the boat or the plane in the story here. I'd be like, <laughs> I'm going to get, oh, there's, there's time. What are you going to do when you live here? Where are you going to live? You need to pay rent. What are you going to do to pay rent? So we try to like manage the, the reality of that dream um, through uh, personal consultations and personal attention to what people really need. Um, I sometimes have to tell people don't come yet. You know, you got to work on your Hebrew or save up your money or you're a little bit, you know, speak to more people because that's not what the army is like, you know, talk mm -hmm. to people. And that all, that's and, and that's also a great thing about today. It's so much easier to speak to people who are really doing it. Absolutely. And the more people that can, they can hear from people what it's really like will give them an accurate taste of what's going on. Awesome. Now, you brought up something, Ulpan, which um, is intensive Hebrew. And for for a lot of people, you know, the language barrier is is an issue, is something that might dissuade them from coming but i know there used to be and i don't know if it it's still around anymore state-sponsored ulpan so there is there is the, as, okay. a, as a gift to new immigrants the government's going to give you five months of intensive ulpan five months five hours a day five days a week whoa you're going to want to take a nap afterwards because it's like whoa there are breaks it's not five hours straight i just want you to say <laughs> um there are breaks and they'll even subsidize continuing it um, I warn people, Michael, that joining an Ulpan is like joining a gym. Michael, have you ever joined a gym? <sighs> yes. When did you stop going <laughs> after you joined? Okay. When I was done. Okay. And then when do you, and then there's always when you stop paying it. There's, yes. there's always this lag, and so people always want to learn Hebrew, but it's it's it, it not. I don't think it's more difficult language. Learning language is difficult. Hebrew mm -hmm. is no more difficult than other people might say. There's no vowels and stuff like that, but. It, the teachers are really very good. It takes it takes attention to detail for it. Um, you have to want it, um, and it is possible to be in Israel and get by with uh, with English or what would I say five words and a hand gesture in Hebrew. The hand gesture is, of course, hold on a second. Not, um, and it's but it, there's a, a level of the culture here that you have to be in tune with and at least be listening to the conversation in Hebrew. Um, there was a terrible tragedy now must be five or six years ago in Haifa with a fire. Oh yeah, um, and it was terrible. And there was a uh, I think it was a bus of uh, police officers or of, uh, that were that was it was burned and and uh, the head police officer uh, was uh, was injured. And I was happy to be in a taxi cab right afterwards, like the next day. And the taxi driver said to me. Carmel, Car I get it, my, <coughs> my voice, Carmel, Carmelo Niftura. And I was like, a little bit like, and it took me time to realize that Carmelo was the name of this cheap, that everyone in Israel was following this news. And because I was not listening to the Hebrew news, I was out of tune with it. There's a, there's a temperature to the, uh, the culture, the, the American idol of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the first, the first winner now must be like eight years ago, Ninette won. And Haaretz, had a picture on it on the bottom fold of the front page newspaper. Now, the elitist newspaper in Israel acknowledged it because 1.2 million Israelis watched her sing and win. Okay? Yeah. J Post had it on page 14. <laughs> Okay. No, it's, they're they're living in different worlds. Yeah. So if you want to understand a little bit more than the weather and what's happening here, um, you want to listen your ear and stretch yourself to it. Um, and there are great websites that you can flip around and, and get the news. Or a lot of people watching these TV shows, uh, you know, <laughs> Stissel, Falda, and stuff like that. And they'll they'll exercise their Hebrew brain by listening to it in Hebrew, even if it has English subtitles on it. Um, it allows them to practice it. So it's it's easier to absorb this culture. But Hebrew is uh, is, is is essential to the fabric. It's a commonality. Uh, one more thing I want to tell you, Michael. I just came from this amazing event uh, I was mentioning before we started mm -hmm. um, over in Tel Aviv here where Nefesh Benefesh is working with the FIDF to help lone soldiers, people who are serving in the Israeli army without parents in the country. Wow. And there's a little over 3,000 of them from countries, 39 countries around the world. 
And we created a day where they can come in and sort out their driver's license, get a new passport. Wow, that's awesome. Here's the best part about it is there was a person there with a sewing machine fixing people's uniforms if they had difficulties. Because, you know, oh my goodness, I have to run it. It was an errands day for them. And the common language there was Hebrew. Because yeah, we, we, we can't just have someone in English and Spanish and French and Russian. Absolutely. Which we have an advisor for all those languages, don't get me wrong. But the service, the commonality of them is Hebrew. So the more that, yes, you can, you can order at the, at the cafe in English and they'll, mm -hmm. under, they'll understand you. But the nuance of the relationship is still there. And I encourage people to struggle with the language and you'll, you'll feel the reward of it. Definitely. I actually was able to exercise my Hebrew chops through pop music, iTunes, just downloading all kinds of stuff, watching it on YouTube that you know my Tutu bone uh, reference. There's just it. It's Kolbeseder. <laughs> Kolbeseder. Tutu bone. All right, that's enough of that. Um, but yeah, that was that was one of the ways that I did it. There's two more things that I'd like to talk about. One of them is the Ali affairs. Those are amazing, and they let you sort out a bunch of stuff. But from what I understand, you should do a little bit of research before you go. If you could talk about those two things. So um, it's uh, the Ali Affairs are just uh, live events that we mm -hmm. do with people where we have advisors and CPAs and real estate lawyers um, and army consultants. Um, they're on spot that you can come out and ask questions to. They are actually, I'm going to say this carefully, they are, you know, there's some inspiration there, okay? But they're actually very technical, okay? So we're not there to try and, convince people to make Aliyah, yeah. okay? It's there for so people can explore this option on a practical level. I, I mean, I, I, the radical statement, I, I I almost don't want to say, but I'm going to say it for you, <laughs> is that I actually don't think people make Aliyah because of idealism. I think there's, I think that the, my, my family or friends in Los Angeles, Chicago, Florida, are as passionate about Israel as I am. Okay, they love Israel. They are Zionists, whatever words, labels you want to put in it. I took a practical step that they that, that they, they're not ready to do. Um, oh, okay. And that and that pr that practicality allows them to allows me or allows people to explore it. So I encourage people if they have an inclination to live in Israel, to actually see if it's financially feasible. Because if it's not financially feasible, you're not going to come. If it is financially feasible, so what's with the Hebrew? So explore that Hebrew option. If you don't have a place to live where you can have friends, and it's financial, then you're not going to come. But what happens when people um, explore it? They it's okay. It allows them to choose. Uh, I'm going to open up here a little more. I'm a hypochondriac Please. about me, Michael. Of course. I, I have, I have, uh, I have weird things about me, <laughs> uh, bumps on my arms. It's I, okay. I go to the doctor like every two months. <laughs> I do blood work every three months. I'm, uh, I'm always worried about it. Um, and if I'm complaining about my neck and you say, Oh Mark, you know, you, you should take Advil or maybe it's your chiropractor. You're not a doctor. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I might listen to you or not. Okay. But if it's really bothering me, I'm going to take out of my time and I'll go see a professional. I'm going to see a doctor and the doctor is going to say to me, Oh, you need to do X, Y, and Z. So if people are, and this is the, the essence of the Aliyah Fair, or calling us up or consulting with us, if you have that itch, if you wonder about it, we encourage you to explore it. There's no obligations. We're not going to lock you on the next flight this summer, <laughs> August August 5th. We have a charter plane of 250 seats. Come aboard. We'll, we'll, well see. That, we'll, my we'll, wife said, are you coming back from this thing? So Because there's, there, there, there's that history of it. There's like this guilt cloud, or there's that mixed emotion about it. But we want people to come out or call us up, that they'll be able to explore it and find out if it's possible now, or I want to do it. When I retire, I'll do when I'm an empty nester. Or there's a difference between retirees and empty nesters. It's an age difference. So, and, and it allows people to see, oh, and some people discover it's not possible for them. Wow. Uh, you know, it turns out I, I have this health condition or my family member has a health condition and they discover that it's, it's, not, it's not for me or I can't do it right now, which is much better than having a regret by saying, oh my goodness, I had a window of opportunity to do it. I, if someone comes in and says, oh my goodness, I really want to serve, in, I really want to go to Israel, but I'm, I don't want to serve in the army. Well, if you're a girl over 21 or boy over 22, you have no army obligation. Suddenly it's like, oh, oh, oh but because it used to be 25, they, mm -hmm. they lowered that obligation. Oh, wow. So it's the change, oh, yeah, but I, I'm going to school. Well, you know, the state of Israel might offer you a free college degree. Uh, really? Well, but, <laughs> but I, my Hebrew's not good, but some of the degrees in English. Uh, uh, 
<laughs> allows people, and therefore, a lot of what we do is is like uh, de- debunk myths for people. And we so we want them to come out. We have a huge event in New York, New Jersey area, um, and we give inspiration there. And we're telling stories, and we have great people. It's great, but the people what drives people out is that is that practical element that they want to they really want to connect to see if this is mm-hmm. if planned. Because although our slogan is like live the dream, it's really plan the dream. No, <laughs> and, if, and if you want anything meaningful in your life, it just doesn't happen. You have to plan it to happen. Absolutely. But so much we're stuck with our day-to-day life on this um, that we forget about our other aspirations. If we want to have a sailboat when we're retired, we have to start a fund for that if we're going to have a sailboat or, or meet with our pension guy to make sure that we're going to be able to buy that sailboat later on. So it, as appropriately, so someone who's thinking about this should uh, should explore it. And that's the essence that drives us with our, with our programming in North America. That's excellent. Um, the last thing that I wanted to ask you about are your, and I wanted to know one, are they still programs, your North and your South program? I know you had a sure, big sure. Go South program. We actually uh, combined them together to something called Go Beyond. Oh, wow. So, that's awesome. So uh, the government of Israel recognizes that a lot of people are moving to the center of the country. I call it the Anglo Diamond between <laughs> Jerusalem and Tel Tel Aviv, Renana, and uh, Modi'in and Beit Shemesh. Okay. Um, and they are looking to try and move um, more Israelis to the periphery, but they also recognize the capital and capabilities of North American Olim that move there and how they can create community. Because for us, community means something different than Israelis. Um, and we understand those building blocks a little bit more. And um, Westerners have uh, the education and capabilities to also bring that dynamic change a little bit faster. So indeed, we have uh, we have a special team that's working to help people not just move there, but understand if they move there, where they're going to work and where they're going to find the capabilities and are they going to have friends when they move there. And therefore, that, that by constructing strategically um, that plan, we're, we're seeing about you know, 600, 700 people move to the north and south each year. Um, and it's part, it's part of a, a mandate from the government. But the other thing that drives it, Michael, is interesting is Anglos drive the price up. Americans drive the price up. Wow. Okay. okay. So, so when there's a new neighborhood and like a new and Modi'in and Anglos move there, it's cheap. And the more they move in, they want to move there because with Anglos, the price. So everyone says, okay, where's the next Modi'in? Okay. <laughs> so, and, but very few people want to be the first person that does it. They don't. Oh want, yeah. They okay. because uh, what I don't. I might not have friends. So it's the early adapters. It's the, it, you have to have those people who are really the pioneers in this idea. Who are ironically the ones who get mad when everyone starts moving. Correct. Them. But, but, but <laughs> not, uh, they get mad, but they're very happy because their uh, investment on oh. their home is going to go up. They like to be grumpy. That They're pe- going to put a cough fix in? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Then they can do it. Exactly. Uh, there's this term, complangos, complaining <laughs> anglos. Yeah, so, so everyone has a legitimate, uh, you know, that's why we have two chief rabbis in Israel because, you know, one has to disagree with the other. <laughs> everyone has to be their own chief rabbi. So, but, what happens is there's always people looking for these new places. So with the government's help, we are, we're finding uh, places that might be ripe for uh, an Anglo community um, and trying to make sure that people are, are, are getting ahead of it. And then in 10 years, people are like, oh, why didn't you tell us about it? And we're like, we told you, you didn't want to listen. <laughs> we said the prices are really right. There's a place in Kharish, um, Karmi Ghat, um, and there's another place that I just heard about yesterday that's like, it's one of these places, like Modi'in 15 years ago was desperate for Nor- for English speakers. Wow. Now they're not. <laughs> they're no. like, like we've got enough. We're, we're, we're going to be the fourth biggest city in Israel. Enough people are moving here each year. It's really, really great. Um, so it's, it's, an, it's an honor to be a part of that, that the government also sees um, the opportunity that's there, that North American Olim are coming and understands the services they need. They're, they're not like, oh, just come. We're going to drop you in a tent. <laughs> which is what they did to the Moroccans yeah, in the 1950s. No, that's, yeah. Because Israel was a poor country and they didn't have the money to do it. Now they're saying, okay, wait a minute. If there's an infrastructure here and they're saying, for example, a, a suburb in Jerusalem, Givat Zev, my wife's cousin just moved from Chile. He's American, but he was mm-hmm. a principal. And the builder brought him in because he's a principal of a school and he speaks English and Spanish and Hebrew. And it's going to be a, a religious school that's moderated a little bit, and he realizes it's going to help establish a, co- a community that's there. Mm-hmm. And in, fi- in five years from now, people are going to be like, oh, the prices in Rom- Romach Givat's ever too much for it. I should have moved then. And, and we're going to say, oh, we told you in 2020. We said, said that there's an opportunity there. But it's, it's hard for people and, and unless they uh, really sit and reflect, mm-hmm. like, like I did about my, uh, at, that, at that juncture I was in my life. Absolutely. What am I going to do? What are my opportunities? And, and when you reflect on really, then you can, you can, you're prepared to make a, a, a bolder step. Perfect. Um, as we wrap this up, 
Um, is there anything that you'd like to say on behalf of yourself or Nefesh Benefesh? The, anything you'd like to, uh, any events coming up, any programs that you'd like to um, speak about? Sure. I guess two comments, uh, open-ended. Um, number one <laughs> is uh, uh, what I said about the doctors that you know you have to consult with it is I think it's, uh, we live in miraculous times. We live in times that uh, despite the news, and I, I check the news, and it, it's it's grumpy, it's sickening, it's hard uh, hard to swallow. Everyone says it, regardless of what side of the aisle you might be on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard because we are really, really in, in it. And um, it, it's, it's, it doesn't cancel the, uh, the necessity that each of us has to take the steering wheel of our life and uh, decide what's there. And it's... It's important to realize that there's someone that, that's going to help you. I, I, it wasn't there for me when I when that's I came. So great. And if it's possible, and something that you want to do, um, four thousand North Americans are moving each year. It's a it's a, it's it's a small number, but it's a large number. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're proud to do whatever it's whatever it is what, to have that conversation. Again, it might be hard news. It might be good news. Uh, but we want to make sure that ev- that everyone is exploring. It. And that's, that leads me to my second point, Michael, is that Israel's real. Okay, yes. is that um, uh, I get annoyed with lots of things, and we were arguing about my my girls are what what's high school they're going to go to next year, and is it going to be good, and the prices of this, and the housing prices, and insurance. We have those normal worries, that normal struggle that people have, um, and when you keep that in mind, it helps us dull a little bit of the the politics that Israel gets into, where people speak about oh Israelis do remember they're real people here. That have concerns and uh, and we're connected. And I really think, and this is the point I wanted to make about that, is that I think what's so special about the people of make Aliyah is that we're a living bridge to um, the Jews around the world. Um, it's amazing that Israel is 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 or is about to be the largest Jewish community in the world for the first time in two thousand years, uh, surpassing the United States. Wow! Um, and that's remarkable. And it's not saying that we're better. Okay, it's I'm not very careful to say that we're bigger. Okay, and bigger sometimes. I mean, in American terms, usually bigger means better, <laughs> but I don't think that always means true. But um, the quality of things that we share with each other allow us to stay connected. And Aliyah is not, I guess this is my closing point, is Aliyah is not a destination, okay? It's not, we just, you're not getting here. You actually have to constantly think about being by Aliyah. It's a motion of going higher and higher. And therefore, we just want to keep on, if your dream to move here, if your dream was to move here, I say, okay, you moved here, what's your next dream? You have to keep on, going up trying for trying to find a ways to do it and that it doesn't mean that we're rejecting the past we're staying connected and that's what's great about i, I love these conversations because a majority of your uh, readers are not going to be living in israel and that we are able to have that connection and wow. to connect with people in israel and and to have that 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 conversation uh, allows us to stay connected about the music um about the culture and 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 to share our reactions and i think that's one of the the greatest things about the the, the project of the state of israel is that it's not it's not us or them it's really that we're that we're connected perfect um, mark thank you so much on behalf of all of us here uh to you and to nefesh benefesh for being a part of this thank you so much all the best all right all right guys that's it Yalla bye. I'm sorry,
עשית אליי, בעינייך עשית 